alegria e damos sequência a, essa, a esse colóquio, introduzindo o Congresso de Atenção Terapêutica, esse Congresso de Humanidades, Narrativas e Humanização em Saúde. E posso dizer que, para mim, apesar de todas as dificuldades, para que a gente consiga, tenha conseguido trazer a professora Rita Sharon, uh, um verdadeiro original caos. Uh, 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 I, I talk about our history. <laughs> And, uh, e para nós é uma grande alegria, uma grande estar é, conseguindo realizar este que, na verdade, um, já está todo mundo uh, com o, o, trans, o tradutor? Because I, 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 I want you to talk in English uh, to read to understand too. So I, I will, I will um, speak in English, is okay? okay? Okay, so for us it's um, um, a, um, a realization of a dream uh, to bring Rita Charon for our center. Uh, I knew uh, Rita about five years ago in, in London uh, when I was talking about The laboratory of the humanities and uh, we talk about medicine and literature and since there we are you know so close in the ideas and dreams so for me it's uh, a very very important to, to have Rita here with us so uh, it's uh, uh, a very I'm very proud I'm very happy with this uh, uh, situation And uh, I want to, uh, I would like to introduce Rita Scher. Uh, she's a, um, a practical uh, clinician in the Columbia uh, University Hospital. And uh, she did um, a PhD in literature. And uh, after that, she runs um, the program of um, uh, medical narratives in the medical school of Columbia University. So. Uh, Everybody knows that she is a very, very important in, in this theme of this uh, colloquium. So for us, it's a, a great proud and a great happy to, to have Rita with us. So uh, with these words, I would like to, to call Rita to give you all conference. Thank you very much. And, and Dante, I remember it wasn't just at a meeting in London. Wasn't there a cafe in Greenwich Village or the Harvard Club in Midtown Manhattan or something? Yes. And I say that because this, what we're talking about, what you've been working on here this, the, these couple of days, but for many of you for a long time, is, is something transnational. It's something trans-historical. And if I use the word originary in my title, um, it certainly does um, refer to a beginning. But the beginning might be with Hippocrates and Galen, or ancient Nordic myths of healing. Do you see? So, so what it is we're doing together uh, spans countries, continents, languages, cultures. Uh, I think, in a way, it, it, it may be even bigger than medicine. I also want to say, I want to say, that this is a very hard time in healthcare for all of us. Healthcare is getting sped up, it's getting corporatized, it's becoming a business, It's in many places losing its soul, or that's how it can feel. And for our students at Columbia, and I'm sure the students here, they come in um, expecting, expecting to learn to be healers, and to learn to respond to patient suffering, and to derive a certain 
sense of satisfaction and joy from doing that. And then they come and they find out, what? Wow, it's a business. I have to see 20 patients in the morning. Um, the, the senior doctors don't seem to want to take care of patients anymore. It's a business. What do we do? And many of us feel very betrayed. Like, this isn't what we had in mind. And I know in New York, 12 minutes with a patient is a long time. So this is, this is the point we are at now, where we, we have to be wise and clear-eyed. Clear-eyed? Clear-eyed. <laughs> Uh, with our good enough vision to be able to see beyond this point in history where we are, toward a way that we can indeed have fidelity to our ideals in medicine. What I tried to do in this paper, that I, this, 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 this set of thoughts that we're going to share right now, is to somehow look back and see how did we kind of end up at this conflictual path, uh, mostly in the ideas that have governed our practice. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, but I wanted to say how much, how can I say it, how deep we are in a struggle for the center of this work that we call medicine or healthcare. And uh, I know and you know that in many places, I think including Sao Paulo, it's at risk. It's at risk. So let's see what we're going to see. So I was in the country not long ago. And I was up early enough to watch the sunrise. And I sure hope many of you watch the sunrise. Because the sky is dark. It's black. It's dark. It becomes kind of purple, violet. And the land underneath that black sky turning purple is itself black. You can't see anything in that land. But quickly, as the sun gets toward the horizon. Slowly or quickly, um, you begin to see details in the land. Suddenly, it's not just a mass of black. Here, it's it's kind of that gray middle. This is Turner, yes. This, this is this is a Turner pastel uh, called Color Beginning. But slowly, I was able to see as I watched the sunrise. No, this is not just black mass, it's trees. I can see individual trees, the crowns, the leafy trees, the green of the trees. And then, of course, the sky brightened. I, my, my eyes kind of pulled toward the east where the, where the sun was so brightening the sky. Um, and then, you see, this is another term. Um, uh, within seconds, within seconds, the, the sun breaks through the horizon, up in the sky. And then it's not just not dark, but it's so, it's so golden, it's white gold. Yes? So it's a way for me to think about and introduce to us all notions of um, light and dark as the known and the unknown. And how so much of our science, our medicine, our lives, our patients, so much is, is veiled in the dark unknown. But the light gradually, insistently, pierces through that darkness. And, and slowly, gradually, if we let it, lets us see more, lets some of that unknown become known. It's as if the darkness is encouraged to give up its secrets. Hmm? And this is, this is what we call science. This is what we call learning. This is what we call um, um, philosophy or literature or history. It's, it's the dark giving up its secrets. Now, now, of course, the sun rises every morning, whether we see it or not. 
And we know it's going to rise. It's not a surprise that the sun rises. Um, so, so sometimes knowledge comes kind of quietly, predictably, and gradually. Hmm? Um, I hope you know some of you the Greek myth of the ship of Theseus. This was a wooden boat. And gradually, as happened to wooden boats, uh, planks would get decayed. The wood would rot, and the plank would be decayed. So in order to keep the ship sailing, they would have to replace the, 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 the rotten or the decayed wood with a new plank of wood, right? So, time goes by, time goes by, gradually, every plank in the ship of Theseus was replaced by new wood. See? There was not one plank of wood that was the original ship of Theseus. And the questions that mortified the philosophers of the time was, is it still the same ship? Do you see? I mean, that's hilarious, right? Is it still the same ship? Even though none of the wood that it started with is still there. The, I'm sorry? Oh, I thought somebody asked this. So, so um, healthcare can sometimes feel like a ship of Theseus, where we do things regularly over and over, but sometimes we learn to do them a little bit better, right? So I'm an internist. So I try to prevent heart attacks and prevent strokes in my patients. So for a long time, I tell them to take 325 milligrams of aspirin a day, and that might prevent a heart attack. Well, we learned that if a patient takes 81 milligrams of aspirin a day, they still won't get the heart attack, and they might not have as much uh, um, hemorrhaging or bleeding problems. So it was safer. Do you see that's like a ship of Theseus? I'm replacing something with a new something that's very similar. All right? That's, that's, that's um, one way that our science and practice of healthcare, medicine, nursing, public health, occupational therapy, physical therapy, chaplaincy, these are all the healthcare disciplines. Um, much of the progress that we make is this kind of gradual, um, almost predictable improvement of tiny bits of practice? But it's the same shape. Right? Well, there's another kind of knowledge. Um, this diagram is from 1568. It depicts the geocentric universe, the universe in which the Earth is at the center. Do you see the Earth? Do you see it? You know what's so very cool? Look, look guys. Here. Okay, so, so he, this, this is 1568. Look how much they knew. This, this, is, this is Asia, this is Russia, this is Asia, this is China, this is India, this is Africa, do you see? This is, this is Europe over there. I mean, they had a pretty good idea of the old world, right? Now look at the new world. They knew about you. <laughs> they didn't know about me. Is that cool? I mean, they only knew, but from like New York to Chicago. And then they didn't realize it went all the way over. But this is 1568, and it's the time when they thought the Earth was at the middle and everything, the suns, the planets, the stars, the constellations, revolve around it. And they knew it to the point that even when things did not make sense, like there were some planets that they could tell did not just go orderly around the Earth, and they said, well, Mars doesn't like to go around the Earth, so it does these other little things too. They realized that Mars did not follow what it was supposed to do, but they gave it a break. They said, well, that's how Mars is. <laughs> do you understand? No, this is important to the argument. So, so then, so then, who's this? 
is Copernicus in 1543, who says, no, 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 the sun is the beginning. The sun is the center of the universe. The, 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 uh, I make a mistake. The, um, this diagram was found in 1568, but the, the belief that the earth was a center was much older than that. So here comes Copernicus, and he says, you know, if you think about the sun as the center, of the universe, with the planets revolving around it, it makes much more sense. Because once the sun was at the center and not the Earth, all the planets did what they were supposed to do, including Mars. Do you see? But, and, and, and then other astronomers realized that Copernicus was right, that this was a much more robust explanatory model for what they were actually experiencing. But the impact was profound because suddenly the human, the human and its planet was not the center. So it changed, it, it, it led to very deep, deep fundamental changes in what persons believed about themselves what persons believed about our history, about our destiny, about who was watching over us. Were we not the God-chosen uh, peoples? Do you see? So, so this was not a ship of Theseus change in knowledge. This was an originary, foundational, transformative change in belief about something very, very central. So what Copernicus was able to do that the earlier astron astronomers couldn't do is he was able to look at what he saw with new eyes. And he was not having to fit his observations into the old models. Do you see? So somehow he had the kind of breakaway knowledge that was not tainted by old false assumptions, all right? Uh, and then, of course, following Galileo, uh, it opened up the scientific revolution. That's what we call it now. Galileo and Kepler and finally Newton. And among them all, what happened was the entire universe became an understandable universe. Newton calls it a mechanical universe. No longer was it some creation of a beneficent God, but rather it became something that we could reduce to its parts. Newton called them corpuscles. We turned around and called them ashes later on. But the idea that the universe, the reality, the earth, is calculable, measurable, reducible into its parts. Uh, uh, um, and by virtue of that, predictable, see, um, uh, opened up a new, a new era. Um, and it, it kind of replaced our idea that the natural world was a divinely inspired world with the idea that, in effect, humans were able to come to fully understand. Right. So this is not a ship of thesis. This is a kind of new knowledge that breaks the mold, that, that, that is indeed revolutionary and transformative. All right? It's a new way of looking at the world. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how some of the beliefs that started up there have continued to alter what we think about and do within health. Uh, this is Vermeer. Uh, this is called the astronomer. And uh, I don't know, but uh, um, the, the, <laughs> the way this scientist is approaching his globe, and it's a globe not of the earth, but of the, the heavens. So what he's looking at are the uh, constellations. He sees the Big Dipper, and he sees uh, 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 
Hercules, and he sees Draco. Uh, and look at how he's bending toward his magical globe. He almost could have one of those hats, you know, like a wizard. Doesn't he look a little like a wizard? Well, he's a scientist, but he's a wizard. And, and it's, it, it, it gives, I think, just the spirit. Vermeer figures out how to give this spirit of sudden, extraordinary, exuberant enlightenment. And, and look at how the light comes in equally shining on the globe of stars and on the face of this marvelous astronomer. Um, um, so, so this was the, uh, this is 17th century, and this is opening toward what was called the age of discovery. This is where, here is also Vermeer, this is the geographer painted in the same year. And some people think it's the same model, the astronomer and the geographer. Some people think it was Leeuwenhoek. Do you remember him? Anton von Leeuwenhoek. He's the one who invented the microscope. So here we have the, the astronomer looking as far away as anyone ever could look into the skies, and the geographer whose understanding of, of the, the Earth and the planets are able to find new continents with the geographers. And then Leeuwenhoek is able to find what we couldn't see because it was too small. Do you see that? So, so all of these three um, are blasting through the frontiers to knowledge. Now you can see beyond the stars. Now you can see beyond uh, uh, the, the, the microscopic. Yes? Um, and the geographers in the age of discovery, this was the 1600s, when Vasco da Gama and Magellan and 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 uh, um, um, you know the 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 very very beginning explorers who would get in these rickety little boats and travel where no one had been. Uh, God knows how they could do it, um, but they were able in this age because of the discoveries of of our astronomers to know where they would go and to get there, right? Um, so it became a different world, and in, in all dimensions, the world got bigger. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm getting toward how that is happening now in health. Um, but there were problems. We became very enamored with ourselves, we humans. We were able to figure out the stars. We were able to find our way around the whole planet to get from Europe around the whole planet to Asia, right? Um, so what happened next, and this is through the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason, is that human reason, the human capacity to think, became supreme. Uh, that's what the Enlightenment was, that, that, that humans, with reason, with thinking, this is Cartesian, this is Rene Descartes, I think, therefore I am, yes? That human reason was supreme. And, and there was a group um, within, within this development called the positivists, who particularly were convinced that human thought and logic could, of its own, come to know the world. That what counted as fact was observable, measurable um, 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 data. That if you couldn't see it, and if you couldn't put calipers on it, it didn't exist. So things like emotion, or sentiment, or metaphor, didn't exist. And what was important was the measurable, calculable materials and events in the human world. And they went even farther to say, as we gather our careful, proven knowledge, the world will improve. <coughs> that there was a steady progress toward improvement built into 
the, uh, the philosophy. Again, the world is knowable, and progress will continue toward a sound, desirable, predictable future. And this is because, as Newton had taught everyone, that the universe is ordered, is logically ordered and known. So, this positivist concept is what we live under today. Um, now, happily, I think happily, um, the positivists were challenged at that time by others. Hegel begins to think and write about dialectics and about ways that the opposites of any one idea have to be taken into account. And that led to Marx and the dialectic materialism of Marx. And it led also, I'm going so quickly, forgive me, I'm already up to the 19th century. <laughs> but, but it was mainly the philosophers within phenomenology, Husserl, Heidegger, Neville Ponty, um, who helped us all understand that not only is the human the detached observer, who patiently, predictably calculates the size of a preformed world, but rather that the human interacts with that world. The human experiences that world. Not just to count it, or to weigh it, or to uh, decide what elements it's made of, but to undergo it through the senses as well as the emotions and the imagination. Do you see how that, how that challenges what had been laid down by even before Newton about the knowability of, of the world? So in a funny way, when we look back, I think Copernicus was a phenomenologist because he was able to think outside of these given uh, logical so what we're left with, our heritage, um, includes the thinking and reasoning of Newton and, and uh, uh, um, um, the, 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 um, positivists. Um, but it also includes the counter-narrative that the world is not sitting there waiting for the human to measure it, but rather the world is there waiting to be enjoyed by, waiting to be, uh, 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 waiting to charm, waiting to interact with the human, who is not a preformed observer, but rather is a um, fully active co-creator of the reality, all right? And then again, we harbor both kinds of thinking within our minds. For those of us in healthcare, it's critical that we harbor both forms of thinking in our mind, and that we use them both. Um, and that there are, uh, how can I say? Uh, one of them, the second, the inactive, is a little harder to hold on to sometimes than the first. Yes? Yes. Okay. See how quickly I'm going? <laughs> so, so 1894, this is Cezanne's still life with bottle and apple basket. Now, now, you stand in front of this painting and you say, I never saw apples acting that way because uh, I mean, the, the, the apples are, are like rolling in two different two different directions off that table. It's hard to say, is it one table or two? Is the table cracked in the middle? Do you see how the table, the, the edge on the left, you can't, you can't really, you can't really follow it. Something happens to it under the, under the tablecloth. And then, and then the, 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 the plate of biscuits is like levitating. It's, it's like, it's, it's floating or something. 
This is not the static universe that we're used to. And, and, um, but, but Cezanne maybe understood, maybe, that all apples and biscuits act this way. Even though none of us ever noticed it. Here's another. Again, the vase has like three different profiles to it. It's, it's vibrating between, like I can see at least three silhouettes of this vase. And again, the, the dish of, of fruit, I don't know if it's, I think it's peaches and apple, I'm not sure. The dish of fruit is like tipsy. It's moving around. The perspectives, there are at least two perspectives here because the mouth of the vase is kind of oval, but the, the mouth of the sugar bowl is much rounder. So again, you say, Cezanne, what, what did you take? You know, what, are you, what are you tipsy on? And it's, it's Merleau Ponty, the phenomenologist, who in a, an essay called Cezanne's Doubt, here, listen to what he says about this painting. Objects are depicted as they appear in instantaneous perception, without fixed contours, bound together by light and air. Cezanne was abandoning himself to the chaos of sensations, to the impression of an emerging order, of an object in the act of appearing. An object in the act of appearing. So this painter was able, and he himself was quite an odd man, he was able not only to see a thing statically, but to be aware of how it came into his seeing. And all of us, all of us, whether we're watching a movie or reading a book or making dinner um, or dressing our child in the morning, um, we don't see things all of a piece, but they emerge to us. They emerge to us as, as we continue to see them. Um, when you see someone on the, on the street, you don't just see a body. Hi, Pedro. Pedro's a doorman in my building. Hi, Doc, where have you been, he says. I see Pedro, but I also see kind of behind Pedro or through Pedro. I see the time he helped me uh, put a rug down in my apartment. I see the time he, I, I hired him to go get some belongings to an old house that I used to live in. I see the past of Pedro along with the present of Pedro. And, and it's not taken away from the reality of today. It is completing the reality of what Pedro and I are to one another. Do you see that? So, so I'm telling you this now because there are elements of this kind of seeing that go on in the office, in, on rounds, in our work. That we're not just seeing a patient um, for, oh, the rash is getting worse. Well, all right. But we're also in intimate contact with all that has happened between us, all that might happen between us, and that it's not the, the patient as an object there that needs to get measured and us as the measurer, but rather this, this kind of levitating, resonating, vibrating, tipsy set of mutual experiences that somehow add up to who we are as as a relation. Yeah? So, so now we are at least heir to, H-E-I-R, heir to, um, um, an understanding of the world that we ourselves have a hand in creating. 
that we ourselves are not just the observers, but have a hand in bringing it, in birthing it, yes? In bringing it into existence by virtue of how we ourselves can relate to it. This, of course, was the beginning of what we now call sociology, anthropology, uh, the kind of narrative history that we're, that we're involved in now. Uh, it was the beginning of Freud. It was certainly the beginning of Einstein and his finally realizing the relativity of time and space. But all of these are ways, and again, we just keep getting wiser and wiser, ways of understanding our own power as interpreters, our singularity as perceivers, um, our creativity in being able to complete pictures that uh, um, things that we see, we complete. We have to imagine things into, into uh, um, existence. And I add one more category there, Interpret interpretation, relativity, creativity, and doubt. Doubt, which is what Copernicus had to have in order to say, well, no, maybe the Earth is not the middle. Radical doubt that lets us all stay within that, that view of the unknown, and maybe even enter into the unknown toward seeing something new. So, so, all right, this is supposed to be about medicine. So, so the kind of foundational change that I've been bringing you through that led from uh, uh, the geocentric to the heliocentric, that led from that to the age of discovery, that led to the age of reason, that led to the, we don't call them ages anymore, but the, the phenomenological term. Well, we are now in such a term, uh, it's an originary chaos. There's a foundational change that is underfoot, and it has to do with the primacy of the human as a calculating animal and the human as a, an active participant in the real. All right? I hope you're with me. I can't see your faces very well, so I, I'm not sure if you're with me because I, I'm, I'm moving along. Um, but here's why I'm here, is to talk about the current situation in healthcare as giving us a shot at a foundational change. Something as radical as the sun is now the center of the universe. The positivists have been holding sway, have been presiding um, um, all along since the Enlightenment. In my country, after World War II, um, medicine became subspecialized. All of a sudden, we had cardiologists, rheumatologists, gastroenterologists, so that medicine, the human body was reduced into its component parts. Um, the National Institutes of Health were funding this great surge in investigatory medicine, in, in scientific research. And they too, and they still, fund the research based on the reduced body parts. So you can get money for heart or lung or kidney. Uh, you can't, it's very hard to get NIH money for a holistic, integrated question. Um, we teach our students, we can't help it. As we teach our students, we teach them to pay attention to first one organ and then the other, right? I mean, we do that, we do that with ours. First you ask all the cardiac questions, then you ask all the stomach questions, then you ask all the rheumatology questions. In our own minds, reducing this, this body to its numbered, calculable parts. It's how we think. And it's so inbred that we're not aware of thinking that way. Even as we listen to patients in the office, we're sorting, we're cataloging, we're, 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 we're putting things into boxes. Even in primary care, even in the emergency room, 
the listener is trained to be identifying. Uh, anything that the patient says is going to be filed under one, one organ system or the other. Um, and as we go along, the, now we have big data, we have evidence-based medicine. Uh, you've been up to ICD-10 for a while, right? Those of you in clinicians? It, we, we just got ICD-10 about a year ago, and God, it took us months to get used to. But ICD-10 is the um, uh, International Classification of Diseases, and it makes the physician or nurse pick a very specific category out of thousands. Very, very specific. It's not just kidney disease. It's the right kidney with associated complications of the eye and the, and the, and the vasculature. It's very, very precise categories. The fact that this is done because it increases patient revenues is worth mentioning. Dare I mention that? Um, so, so this tendency toward paying attention only to that which can be reduced, empirically tested, um, um, and, and calculated remains essentially the paradigm for for medicine. Um, I, had a, I had a student last last year who presented me a case. It was a, a, um, a middle-aged man who was doing very poorly with um, HIV AIDS. And the, the student presents me a case and the entire first paragraph of his presentation had no words in it. It was numbers and acronyms and abbreviations. And this was not a stupid kid. I said, I said, there's no English in that entire paragraph. And he blushed and he said, that's how the interns do. So, so um, it is not our imagination that the positivist tendencies have prevented us from seeing things maybe as for what they are. And certainly might mislead some of our students into thinking that this is the way it is. So um, narrative medicine is one of the foundational changes that have occurred in the past, I give it like three decades, that, that things, the positivist um, universe of medicine seemed to call forth challenges to itself in the same way that the phenomenologists challenged the uh, Cartesians. Um, it was narrative medicine, it was relationship-centered care, person-centered care, patient-centered care, shared decision-making. I don't know if these are typical here in Brazil, biopsychosocial medicine. There were many ways by which people in healthcare rebel against the primacy of the, 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 the reducible, empirically valid only uh, concepts. And, and we, I say narrative medicine and its cousins, provided new tools for understanding illness and those who bore the illness. They were new perceptual tools, interpretive tools, and what I call particularizing, which is to say there's a doctor and a patient in the room, but it's only that one patient and that one doctor. And whatever's going to happen there depends on the two of them. Uh, particularizing. So that, so that we all, from different corners, uh, brought into healthcare means of seasoning the positivist reductive approach with a far richer, in Cezanne's uh, point of view, far richer capacity to perceive not just the outlines of things, but the things themselves. Um, it gave, it, 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 it unfurled different problems. It brought different strengths. 
It used different frames around what our patients were saying to us. Um, health, health became not only biomedical. That if someone was in ill health, it wasn't only to do with a malfunction of one of its parts. Um, illness is not only biomedical. Living in time is not only biomedical, and certainly dying is not only biomedical. So, so these narrative, I, I think of them as challenges. Um, narrative medicine is not a ship of Theseus. We are not just tinkering around the edges to come up with slightly better ways to try to prevent heart attack but rather opening up big challenges to the foundation of what is it we're doing in the face of disease. What is it we're doing in the face of the ill person? And again, this is hard to do now when the, um, the money and the power and the industry uh, exists on the side of the empiricist reductive approach. Do you see? So uh, this may not be the case in Brazil as much as it, as it is in New York, but the pharmaceutical companies and the device manufacturing companies and the diagnostic apparatus manufacturing companies are, are, are deciding what constitutes disease and are deciding what constitutes um, problems worthy of our attention. So these are the kinds of things that I think we're beginning to challenge. Now I've had here a painting by Mark Rothko in front of you. And I don't know if you've been watching it, but uh, if you watch a uh, painting, Rothko is a, a near contemporary, he died in the 1960s uh, by his own hand. Um, and if, if you spend enough time in a museum or even in the dark with a slide watching a Rothko, it starts doing things to you. The, 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 the green starts to bleed into the blue, and the brown at the bottom starts to look more like soil than a stripe. And do, do you see that? They, they, they kind of come alive in a very strange way. You get, you get absorbed. And Rothko himself got very fussy about how his paintings were hung in a museum, and he insisted that they put benches in front of them and that the lights be low, because he wanted the viewer <coughs> to absorb the painting, right? And at the same time, the painting absorbs the viewer. Um, this is not a painting about anything. There's no apples and teacups in this painting. It's, 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 there's no plot. There's no object. There's no story. Instead, it's a painting about balance and composition, maybe saturation of color, maybe horizon. There may be a hint of a horizon, but it's alive for the viewer, and it's up to the viewer. It's up to the viewer to let the painting be the painting it, it can be. Do you see? Uh, this is the painting that we chose as the, as the cover for our latest book on narrative medicine. It's very close to my heart. I track down who owns it. I'm trying to arrange a, a, a meeting between me and this painting. So, so um, um, and, and I put it here only because I love it. And, and it has, for me, the quality of what it is that we seek to uh, made possible as we meet patients, as we absorb, as we get absorbed by their situation, as we absorb what it is that they are going through. So we call narrative medicine a person-centered care. It sounds like a banal phrase, um, but I think it's very radical to say it's not the earth at the center, it's not the science at the center. It's not the body at the center. It's the person at the center. And if you really believe that, 
It is a radical departure from what we do now. Uh, we were all, those of us who started narrative medicine, and this was in 2000, we were all anti-positivists. And we were looking for ways to bring interpretation, to bring singularity, to bring creativity and doubt into the healthcare, to bring the personal relations between the clinician and the patient into the center, and to understand that what they were doing together, yes, diagnosing, prescribing, doing operations, delivering babies, we do that. But we're also, with a patient, creating and discovering the meaning and the outcome of these careers in illness. So, so and, and we've been watching to see how the clinical work is transformed as the human beings doing the work experience one another in this way. So, so let me tell you a, a bit about what, what happens as we've been replacing the methods of reductive science with some of these perceptive, imaginative, creative, and relational ways of, 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 of being. Um, again, uh, just to repeat what we said before, that illness is not a preformed object to be displayed to a preformed observer in 12 minutes in the office, but instead that the problem, whatever it might be, the problem emerges as the patient struggles to tell of the situation. And it may be chest pain and insomnia. It may be chronic, unlocalizable pain. But it's certainly not going to be encapsulable as only that. It can't only be an ICD-10 code. We try to follow the uh, advice of Simone Weil, the philosopher who says the only question worth, ask, worth asking another is, what are you going through? So the problem will likely include bodily distress. It won't be reduced to that. Our patients often don't know why they came in to see us. Don't you find that? Well, I just don't feel myself, they'll say. Um, so they, they may not know why they're here, but but there's going to be more to be heard than that chest pain or insomnia. And the chest pain or insomnia, even it, won't be reached without the full narrative treatment given by the patient. So, so what is it that happens then in, in, this, in this other form of, of health care? This, this is a this is a depiction of, of what I call attention. It's, it's two women. The name of the painting, this is Mary Cassant. The name of the painting is The Conversation. And you see the very, uh, I, I don't know what to call it, um, the look on the face of the listener is, is not. intelligence, she's looking with discernment, she's taking in what the teller is telling. The light is on the face of the teller, although we don't see her. Um, um, and then I, I've taken this kind of as an icon of the, the, the form of listening that, that, that we've been trying to describe. So the, the foundational change that we can experience in these narrative forms, all my narrative cousins belong here with me, um, is the full shocking realization that the work begins with the person who is, if only temporarily, a patient. And, and, and I, I, I remember to say person-centered and not patient-centered because although she may be a patient today because she's talking about her psoriasis. 
there's a lot more to her than her psoriasis. So it's the entire personhood and not just the patienthood that we are listening for. Before any good can be done by a doctor or nurse, the patient must be heard. The patient must be perceived. The patient must be witnessed in as full and daring way as can be achieved. Merleau-Ponty says of Cezanne's still life, he says, what Cezanne was able to see and what it is that we try to see is the impression of an emerging order, of an object in the act of appearing. And then later he says, expressing what exists is an endless task. So when we look at it this way, the first visit with a new patient is stunning. It's grueling. It's majestic. You have no idea. You have no idea. Anything can happen. And, and it's not go through the checklist and find out do you get headaches or belly aches. It is instead this remarkable uh, something of grave importance is slowly coming into view. Hmm? You have to be prepared to hear anything. Um, you know, even though the kinds of things that people have to come talk to us about can be shameful or, you know, about intimate parts of their body, they're not used to talking about those to strangers, uh, they may have to admit, no, I didn't lose weight, no, I didn't stop smoking. It, it's almost like having a body somehow is shameful in itself or, or a little ridiculous, you know, you bring your body in to be seen. Um, um, and instead, what we're trying for is that the teller be in the light. These are the same two women. This time, the painting is called Two Sisters. So the teller is in the light. The listener is, is not only in the shadow, but is behind a fan, which seems to be uh, emphasizing that the teller is the one um, of prestige, yes? Uh, Wittgenstein says, and I think this, this happens in this painting, listening, as it were, searches for an auditory impression, and so can't point at it, but only at the place where it is searching for it. We don't know what it is we want to hear. This is the, this is the radical stance. We're not trying to hear uh, the story of Angela. Oh, you have chest pain. Is it sharp or dull? Does it go into your shoulder? Does it make you nauseated? We're not looking for something or listening for something. We're rather radically opening ourselves to what it is that might be in the act of appearing. And the patient doesn't know what she's come to tell us about, that it's in the act of telling that she finds out. And you know in, in contrast that what usually goes on in our offices is a, I call it a subjugated pastiche, which is to say the person in control, and that would be us, asks a set of questions and very freely interrupts as the patient's trying to answer those questions. And sometimes it feels like, sometimes it feels like the, what the patient is telling is kind of like a river. The, when I came here, the plane, this morning, it was, I don't know, five o'clock maybe, I don't know, but the plane, and I looked out the window, and I couldn't, what is that? I'm looking out the window, what is that? It was this enormous, complex, I couldn't tell which way the water was going, but it was this tremendous, uh, 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 now, well, it was the Amazon. I saw the Amazon this morning. <laughs> it was stunning. And I started la I was the only one awake on the plane, and I'm laughing. I'm saying the Amazon surprised me out of my sleep. But it's like that. So the patient begins to tell. And it's literally, think of it as a river. And, and, and the doctor will come in and say, is it sharp or dull? How many cigarettes do you smoke a day? And so it, it dams up the river. Do you see what I mean? It dams up the flow. 
forever lost are those fields out there that would have been watered by that river had it not been damned. And instead they wither and die. Not to be heard by the physician and not to be heard by the patient. They wither and die. So all of these ways in which we come to practice and which is the way you have to practice if you have 8 minutes or 12 minutes, this is what they do. They squander what would be the fertility, the fertile fields of patients' narratives in telling themselves and then in telling us what is the matter. So um, what we propose is that we can provide unconditional listening to patients. And, and again, even if you have 12 minutes, even that way, we do it all the time. We teach our kids in the clinic to do this. You roll away from the computer. You don't type. You don't, for a minute, you don't type. You don't write. You listen. You stop yourself from asking a question to see where that river is going. We, we, we write down what we hear, even like a paragraph, a couple of sentences. You write down just what, 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 what did you hear? You give that to the patient the next time you see her. She's stunned, my doctor wrote about me. And then she said, this happens all the time. She says, you know, we left something out last time. And don't you know that's when I hear about the trauma and the loss and the stillbirths and the violence and the alcoholism, do you see? So, so it's not like this is not possible to do, to listen without knowing what you're listening for. We, we include witnesses in our practice, because you can't do this all by yourself. So we train our graduate students, medical students, to sit in during the office hours, to help the physician and patient notice what happens between them. And they write witness notes. And they give that to the doctor. They give it to the patient sometimes. This is what happened. It's a phenomenological interaction, isn't it? I mean, a phenomenological uh, intervention. Got it? And it's simply by saying, what, what, what happened here? What, what, what have I been able to notice? This is Cezanne's car player. It's at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. I came across it, I didn't know it was there. I said, oh my god, it's like an old friend. Um, and Cezanne painted, the, these were the peasants, these were the farm workers on his father's farm in, in France. And he thought that they had such nobility, they represented for him the nobility of the land, of the beloved land of his. But there they are, playing cards, uh, maybe, it might be tense, it might be relaxed, it's hard to tell. They're in a saloon, they're playing cards. Looks like they've been doing that all their lives, doesn't it? <laughs> Listen to what, again, this is Merleau Ponty. He, he's talking about the artist. I want you to listen to this sentence as if it's about you, about the clinician. The artist is the one who arrests the spectacle in which most men take part without really seeing it, and who make it visible to the most human among them. The artist and the clinician are responsible for seeing, for seeing, for arresting the spectacle of life, which most men don't get to see, and then we're obliged to show it to others. Do you see how that's our work? that we see the parts of patients that are naked, exposed, needy, worried, questioning, suffering. And we see them because of our privilege as physicians, as nurses, as therapists. It's our privilege. And so, in return for the privilege, we are responsible. It is our duty to let others know of this suffering. Certainly, 
and we let one another know as we're caring for patients, but I think in a much, much wider way. We have a private, privileged access to suffering. Um, it is not always the case that today, in our practices today, we feel that that's what we do. And yet, indeed, this is what we do. That we, although healthy, on the whole, uh, uh, although we may not be um, the patient at that moment, it is our duty to perceive and then represent in some way what that suffering is. Uh, we, 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 we take a lot of time to teach our students how to write, uh, and increasingly how to draw, how to paint, how to dance, how to photograph, how to uh, create graphic novels. We want them very much to have skills of representation, the capacity to actually capture in some medium what it is that you see. And the reason we do that is you don't perceive anything until you represent it. We know that. It's part of aesthetic commandments. It's only when we represent something that we get to see it ourselves. So we're very, very aggressive about teaching all of our clinical students these very creative skills. And it's not, it's not just because it's enjoyable, it happens to be enjoyable, but that's not why we do it. Uh, it's not to give them a veneer of civilization. It's to equip them to do their jobs. Huh? So this is Chagall. <laughs> it's called the newlyweds. There's something so witty and gorgeous about these, um, the couple in love, the hoopah in the back there. <laughs> The, 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 the little marriage hut, the wacky, the wacky um, birds, the naked fiddler, the God knows what's going on over there. Uh, and, and it's just, a, it, it's a way for us to end on a note of affiliation. And none of this, none of this work goes on outside of relation, outside of relation, whether it's between the two newlyweds or the wacky, bird and the, and the fiddle player. Uh, we are in this um, not alone, right? An account of oneself is always given to another. There is no account of self. This is what patients do. They give accounts of themselves. There is no account of self that does not require another. And we, because we're privileged, become that other. And what we have to do what we have to do, we do all at once. We, we, we donate ourselves as that other. We put ourselves at the service of the patient to take in the full import of what might be said. We do our best to recognize. We do our best to witness. We do our best, we cannot help but affiliate with that person if we're able to achieve this radical kind of listening where we're not listening for a symptom or a diagnosis or an ICD-10 but we're listening for that which that river might contain. Many things happen at once when we do this. The teller entrusts his or her story into the cup of attention of that listener. The teller is narrativizing personal experience into a tellable form. What I mean here is this. It is in the telling that the story emerges. It is in the telling that the plot emerges from the non-narrative. For life as it is lived is plotless. Got it? You don't live a plot. You live random, contradictory, wacky, unpredictable things, and it's only when you tell somebody about it that you end up saying, and then, and then, and because, and so, and see? 
So, so life as it is lived is plotless. Only in the configuring is the plot born. And are we not lucky that our job is to listen as these plots are born? And more than that, that we have something to contribute to that plot making. So what we've been talking about, what we've been talking about is creativity and freedom. And what I've been trying to contrast throughout this, 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 this meeting is ways in which we can use our power as radical listeners, as attentive listeners, as, as creative listeners to serve the suffering, to tolerate the suffering, to not turn away from it, because we within ourselves know the value of our own being able to sit and receive and tolerate those who suffer. Now, what remains to, for all of us to do is to figure out ways going forward that these kinds of anti-positivist, inactive, creative forces can in some way survive and even help to shape the right now overwhelming corporatization, bureaucratization, commodification, speeding up of healthcare. Um, and we can't do it, uh, you know, city by city or even continent by continent. But what is happening now is a real muscular uh, uh, unity. I mean, unity from North America, South America, Asia, Africa, Europe, UK, Middle East. Um, uh, there, is, there is such unity among clinicians, among patients. What we sometimes don't quite know is that the clinicians and the patients are on the same side, right? We bicker at one another, we blame one another, and yet, we are seeing exactly the same problems, and I think increasingly exactly the same solutions, which have to do with surpassing the current empiricist, reductive, and now corporate model toward a model that allows us to bear witness to one another's suffering and to join. Thank you. se realizando é uma palestra extremamente inspiradora inspiradora primeiro do ponto de vista dos sentidos depois do ponto de vista dos sentimentos da inteligência e que certamente vai deixar em cada um de nós 
uma instigação do ponto de vista da vontade. Portanto, uma palestra completa. É, aquilo que nós, na, aqui no, no Centro de História e Filosofia da Ciência da Saúde, costumamos chamar de uma autêntica experiência humanística. Uma experiência que nos mobiliza no afeto, na inteligência e na vontade. Rita, você não só é, nos premiou é, numa visão do ponto de vista histórico e do ponto de vista sociológico, caracterizando o lugar das medical narratives dentro do contexto da educação e da prática médica no mundo contemporâneo, como também você nos mostrou, uh, não só através dos conceitos, mas principalmente da forma de se comunicar. E eu acho que, apesar de todas as dificuldades, apesar de todas as interpéries que sofremos para que você estivesse aqui hoje, valeu muito a pena, porque realmente tal intervenção é profundamente mobilizadora. E é isso que nós precisamos, não só de ideias e conceitos, não só de uma perspectiva filosófica, não só de uma perspectiva histórica, que sem dúvida nenhuma é muito importante, e eu estaria sendo hipócrita se não ressaltasse esses aspectos justamente por vir da área das humanidades mas você trouxe aqui um outro elemento e acho que é por isso que você está aqui hoje um outro elemento fundamental que é a perspectiva do amor ou seja a maneira de olhar para o paciente com amor de falar sobre o paciente com o amor e pensar a medicina com o amor é muito triste e, ao mesmo tempo, muito uh, complicado o fato de que a palavra amor tenha sumido do vocabulário acadêmico, se é que algum dia ela esteve presente. Nós conversamos agora, vindo para cá, justamente de que, apesar de vivermos num mundo extremamente conturbado, problemático, quase caótico, a gente sente esse movimento crescendo, essa, essa mobilização crescente das pessoas de resgatar o centro da efetiva humanização, que é o amor. Não esse amor, digamos assim, piegas, né? ah, meramente evocativo, mas aquilo que Dostoiévski chamava de amor ativo. Quando ele dizia, no seu livro Irmãos Karamazov, através do personagem do Starets Zózima, quando colocado dois personagens frente a frente, um dizia ao Starets Zózima, eu amo a humanidade, mas não consigo suportar a pessoa que funga do meu lado. <risos> e o Starets Zózima responde que o amor ativo é justamente não o amor que se dirige a um conceito abstrato de humanidade, mas algo muito concreto, que é exatamente aquela pessoa que está fungando ao seu lado. Este é o amor ativo. E é isso, de certa forma, que eu acho que a medicina narrativa pode e tem a nos ensinar. Ou seja, de que maneira levar os nossos estudantes os nossos médicos, os nossos profissionais da saúde, a entender o que é o amor ativo. E eu acho que não há outro caminho para isso, senão através das narrativas. Seja dessas narrativas maravilhosas que você apresentou aqui, através da arte, das artes plásticas, seja através daquelas outras narrativas que vêm através da literatura e das próprias, das próprias histórias dos pacientes, como nós aqui hoje pela manhã, também tivemos a oportunidade de ver. Então, nesse sentido, eu gostaria de agradecer muito, e eu sabia que, apesar 
de, toda, de todas as duas noites sem dormir, de todos os, os problemas consulares, de visto, de aeroportos e aviões e carros e tudo, uh, valeria a pena e realmente eu me sinto realizado, porque era exatamente isso o que eu queria transmitir aqui hoje e a sua palestra, a sua conferência transmitiu plenamente. Muito obrigado. Nós temos alguns poucos minutos, infelizmente, mas vamos aproveitá-los bem. E para que a gente possa aproveitar bem esses minutos de conversa com a Rita Chairman, eu pediria que uh, a gente fizesse duas perguntas por vez aqui ao Yuri. O Yuri vai acolher uh, os, aqueles que vão fazer perguntas. Vamos fazer duas perguntas, a professora Rita Chairman responde essas duas, depois fazemos mais duas e aí vemos se a gente tem mais tempo para outras duas, ok? Uh, good afternoon, professora Rita Charon. Meu, vou falar em português. Meu nome é Afonso, eu estive no 2015, 2015 workshop. Oh. Yes, I was there. And since there, uh, I, I, I have a question. Uh, em uma das atividades que nós tínhamos, nós tínhamos que revelar a origem do nosso nome. My, the, the, the inception, the origin of my name, Afonso, and, uh, and so on. Uh, well, when I, uh, uh, at this point, uh, suddenly, uh, I, I became uh, thinking with my Portuguese Brazilian mind. <laughs> uh, so, since then, uh, I think about How do you do you work with this cross-cultural thing or cross-cultural meaning? I, I have read that you uh, see Latino patients. And, uh, então é isso, quer dizer, a, a pergunta. E nós tínhamos uma das atividades tínhamos que falar o nosso nome e falar por uh, a origem do nosso nome. E aí de repente eu e, e, e aí eu vi que essa questão do, da, da narrativa, a narrativa tem muito da própria linguagem nossa, do português, até mesmo do português brasileiro, do português de Portugal, é, é, do espanhol, do inglês. Então, e nós, estu, nós lemos muito os seus livros, estudamos muito. Como trabalhar com essa coisa cross-cultural thing? É, boa tarde, eu sou Eliana, professora da Faculdade de Medicina de Botucatu, é, interior. E eu também estive lá, fiz uh, workshop com vocês e aprendi essa questão de trabalhar com o nome. E trabalho todos os anos com essa questão, os alunos fazem no primeiro ano uma busca da história do seu nome. E como eles acompanham recém-nascidos por dois anos, quando eles chegam na casa, a primeira pergunta que eles fazem para as mães, qual é a história do bebê? Então, agradeço muito a dica. Mas o que eu queria conversar é que, atualmente, eu trabalho num ambulatório de pediatria genética, com crianças com doenças muito graves, muito raras. E, assim, o um modelo de atendimento é um modelo extremamente biomédico. E, às vezes, eu sinto muita dificuldade de abrir essa porta para a narrativa. É como se as mães e as crianças olhassem para mim e perguntassem isso não está no script. Isso não conta nessa consulta. É, eu, não, eu não consigo entender pra, para o que você está me perguntando isso. Então, eu acho que, assim, a gente trabalha com medicina centrada na pessoa, na atenção básica. Lá eu sinto que é um espaço de conforto. Mas quando a gente vai para um ambulatório de especialidade, muito pesado, é, abrir essa porta, é, me parece que às vezes os pacientes têm dificuldade. Porque eles acham 
Aquele espaço não é para isso. Então, eu queria perguntar um pouco como é que você vê isso, né? até como nefrologista, que também uh, são pacientes, às vezes, muito graves, quer dizer, quando a gente abre essa porta da narrativa, e às vezes o próprio paciente se assusta. Né? Como é que a gente pode trabalhar um pouco mais isso? Two remarkably complex, beautiful questions. Um, and do you see how, if Alfonso started a conversation by thinking about his name and the language in which his name is uttered, um, and then our second question, um, talked about a different language, isn't it? Uh, it, it uh, you're talking about genomic language. You're talking about the language of DNA so that the human body indeed has its language. It has many languages. Um, so what we are is simply encircled with text. We're encircled with um, the, 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 the power of a language to speak its truth. So when we have people at workshops, we don't say everybody has to write in English. What a horrible thing that would be. Just, just write your heart out in whatever language. We just had a, a, a workshop this past weekend. We just finished one up um, Sunday evening. Uh, the workshops that people come to New York, there were like 120 this time in New York. And, and the whole weekend is spent in very intensive reading, writing, telling one another, listening. Um, and and uh, there were people from eight different continents. I mean, every continent was represented. So there were probably 20 languages there. So here, so, uh, and I'm going to get to the second part of your question. But the first part, Alfonso's and the first part of your question, were, were ways of thinking about the power of our language to create and shape our thoughts, to create and shape our emotions, our relations, our realities. And this is what I'm talking about. If the river gets dammed up, that's what I'm talking about, is that very power of the language to, to create us. We are created by the ways in which our thoughts, cultural, personal, historical, the, the national, uh, become configured into something that can then give meaning. Um, and in a most beautiful biological way, DNA does that too. And um, although we have some troubles with the excesses of the reductionist, empiricist uh, ways of science, um, we can only be in awe of this extraordinary language that is just, just now being decoded as we're coming to learn what all these bits of chromosomes and, and stretches of DNA do. We used to think they were junk. These long, long stretches of DNA, we said, ah, that's just junk. Uh-uh. It's all doing something. So it's stunning. We're just at the, at the beginning of knowing what the something is. But then the second part of the question is much more ominous. It's that patients have gotten used to us as being um, nuts and bolts. To, it, not, nuts and bolts, it's it just the mechanical, the mechanics. They think we're the mechanics. This is so sad, as I hear you, that the patients think this is not the place to talk about my fear. This is not the place to talk about the unjustness, the random, random, unfair, why did my kid get chosen for this horrible disease? That's what we should be there for. And the fact that they think it's weird if you ask that, is just such an indictment of how far we've gone down that road. So 
man, you got yourself a hard task, is to figure out where's the culture change going to come. The patients will come to you because you're the place where they can talk about fear and rage and regret and envy. The envy of one of these parents for the parents of a healthy child. You know? That should be in our, that should be what we do. Because if we don't, we'll never know half of what the suffering is, is from. So that's, this is our future. Wow. <laughs> Nós teremos tempo para mais duas perguntas e, e encerramos. Vamos lá. Tem que vir aqui na frente, rapidinho. Se for mais uma, será mais uma. E finalizamos. Eu peço que sejam bastante sintéticos nas perguntas, por favor. professora de, de literatura da Universidade do Estado da Bahia é, bem e emocionada e também me sentindo uma das pessoas mais privilegiadas, privilegiadas do mundo por é, ouvir esta é, palestra magistral eu tudo a ver com muito do que eu penso uh, é mesmo uma, uma questão uh, a senhora disse que o artista e o médico captura uh, o espetáculo da vida. Uh, eu penso que o artista captura ou persegue muito mais uh, o obscuro da vida, o desconhecido. Ele se defronta o tempo inteiro com isso e é exatamente por isso que eles produzem incessantemente. A sua palestra mostrou o tempo inteiro esse jogo de luz e sombra, mas muito mais sombra que foi o que vemos nos quadros do Cezanne. Uh, então eu gostaria de saber, uh, enquanto os médicos não olharem aquilo que é o mais absolutamente desconhecido, uh, que é a morte, e eu acho que esse é o grande temor, uh, como é possível é, se não temos nessa formação médica, ou melhor, eu vou reformular minha questão, como a narrativa médica trabalha essa questão uh, da morte na formação médica? Porque eu acho que se o médico pensa, eu trabalho com o espetáculo da vida e é olhar só sobre a perspectiva da clareira, ele não vai ver aquilo que é o mais importante, que é o obscuro e aquilo que somos, definitivamente que é o desconhecido. Muito obrigada. É, olá, meu nome é Scarlett, sou estudante de medicina aqui da faculdade e, e o que eu queria perguntar à senhora é que é, atualmente nós temos ouvido muito falar sobre inteligência artificial e como nós vamos ser é, replaced, né, sub, é, substituídos por robôs e, e eu queria saber como que a senhora vê isso do ponto de vista da relação médico-paciente e nos Estados Unidos, na sua Universidade da Colômbia, é, o que tem sido falado sobre isso? Nós fazemos isso também. Você sabe o Watson? Você sabe o IBM Watson? Ok, então eles estão desenvolvendo os internos, os internos, os IBM Watson internos. And, and, and they're, they're trying to scare us, you know, pretty soon every medical office is going to have a Watson in it. And we say, is that great? Because then Watson will do the boring stuff, and I get to do what only the human can do. <laughs> right? So, no, no, you know, I'm so glad you asked that, because sometimes our way of thinking confuses people, and they say, oh, you want to go back to the old days. And that's the last thing I want to do, or anybody, is go back to the old days. I mean, not just before anesthesia and penicillin, but, 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 uh, every day,
day, where, where did my, where did you go? The person who just asked that question, there you go. Every, every day, the universe gets more complex and beautiful. Um, when I talk about creativity and doubt, I'm not just talking about artists. I'm talking about scientists and artists, both. Uh, at, at Columbia, even, we're, we're not making the distinction anymore, art on this side and science on that side. I, I think we're beyond that. I think we're to the point that there are, the creative artist or scientist is the one who can tolerate doubt. So I distinguish between ones who can tolerate doubt and ones who try to banish it. Do you see? So, so all of these ways in which we're, we're, we're drawn to the unknown and, and we're, 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 we're uh, kneeling, kneeling slowly uh, uh, in awe, uncovering these aspects of the real that were just not available to us, you know, weeks ago. The work that my colleagues are doing at Columbia in precision medicine, in, in human genomics, in neuroscience, are absolutely spellbinding to me. Uh, and the, the, we're starting a new department and, um, in narrative medicine and ethics. And what we're hoping is that our department becomes the place where the scientists and the artists can meet. Do you see? In this effort of awe at what is discoverable, right? So AI, bring it on. <laughs> um, and, and the first question was about death. Um, you, um, where is she? Where is the person who asked the question? Here she is. So, so remember George Lukács, the literary scholar in theory of the novel, who says the, the, the entire inner workings of the novel was created in order to struggle against the power of time. Hmm? The novel is there to struggle against the problem of time. Medicine is there in order to struggle against the problem of time. So we artists or scientists are doing the same thing. We're trying to come to grips with being a organism who lives in time. And of course the deepest unknown is death. Uh, how many religions have been invented to deal with death? Uh, we don't know how to do it very well. We're having, our, our next narrative medicine workshop is going to be on narrative palliative care. Because we think that palliative care of all the branches of clinical work, palliative care is the closest to practice narrative medicine. So we're doing a whole workshop with the palliative care group. Um, and it's because the palliative care clinicians are the ones who find somehow the bravery to not run away from death. So I think your question is absolutely the central one. Um, the more the more, but here's a paradox. The, the better we are at all of these mysteries of DNA and mysteries of intelligence and what is consciousness and why do these uh, horrible genetic diseases continue to happen, um, let us, I don't want for us to be carried away with our sudden smartness that we don't realize how little we allow ourselves to know about dying. And it may be that part of the future of this revolution is that we find the courage and inspiration to come close to it, to not run away, to not turn the face, to not leave the washing of the body after 
patient has died in the hands of the nurse's aides? No. Did that be our task? Did that be our task to accompany people all the way to death and maybe beyond? And then maybe we'll be equal to our name. Com essas palavras, <risos> bastante que vai ficar no nosso coração, na nossa memória, para que a gente fique meditando muito tempo ainda, até a próxima volta da vida aqui ao Brasil. Essa vida meteórica e bela entre nós. Se bem que a, o símbolo do meteoro ou da estrela de Belém é sempre a alviçareira. Ela anuncia algo novo. Eu começava o nosso é, colóquio falando hum, do, da problemática de fazermos o colóquio perto do dia das bruxas e termino uh, falando uh, da conveniência também de fazermos nas vésperas do tempo de Natal. Uh, e nesse sentido... Uh, é, a vida da, da Rita aqui, assim como todos os outros convidados, especialmente a professora Isabel, que esteve aqui de manhã conosco, né? a mesa redonda que aqui uh, esteve, os trabalhos que foram apresentados, é, vem todos nessa mesma direção de reforço. Uh, apesar de estarmos vivendo num mundo uh, que aparentemente caminha Uh, de forma absolutamente destrambelhada para o caos, uh, nós sentimos também um movimento de resgate uh, da construção, podemos dizer assim, de um novo cosmos, como os gregos já sabiam desde sempre. Uh, e nesse sentido, uh, não só as medical narratives, mas o resgate da narrativa em si, independente e até transcendendo o campo da saúde, sem dúvida não nossa conta como é, uma grande esperança de reconstrução da cultura, da história e da humanidade. Muito obrigado a todos. Lembrando que a gente continua é, no, é, na parte de quinta-feira com o Congresso de Atenção é, Terapêutica. Muito obrigado.